death of Ivan Ilyich. And he seemed to be doing good again. Uh, but there, then there's some ominous entries. Day 78, he remarks about some potato seeds. He started eating potato seeds. He, they were growing all over the seeds of a plant called Eskimo potato. He started gathering them and eating them. And then a little later, a month later, day 94, he's been in three months now, and it begins, entry begins, woodpecker, frog. Those are the animals he killed that day. And then, extremely weak, <coughs> fault of potato seed, much trouble just to stand up, starving, great jeopardy. Six days later, an even more ominous entry. Day 100, made it. He was proud of making it to this important milestone. But in weakest condition of life, death looms as a serious threat. Too weak to walk out. Have literally become trapped in the wild. No game. He knew he was trapped by the high water. He knew he'd eaten something that had apparently poisoned him. And I speculate about this in the book, Into the Wild. But at, at one point, he realized he was going to die, and no one could save him. And he faced death very bravely. He tore a page out of one of, his, one of his treasured novels, and he wrote this note on the back of it. I've had a happy life, and thank the Lord. Goodbye, and may God bless all. And then, it must have been the last of his strength, he walked outside, he propped up his Minolta, and he took this picture of himself holding up that sign, that farewell note, waving goodbye. You can see how emaciated and gaunt he is. Um, then he, he went back into the bus, crawled into a sleeping bag his mother had made for him, and lay down. Nineteen days later, September 1st, moose season opened, and these hunters came in, and they found the camels in the back of the bus. He would perished. Um, I wrote about this for Outside Magazine, and then went on to write Into the Wild, the book. And both the article and the mail, and, and the magazine generated a lot of mail. The magazine article generated more mail than any article in the magazine's history. And much of this mail was not <laughs> positive. It was highly critical of McCandless for being an idiot, for being reckless and arrogant and stupid and suicidal. And it was critical of me for glorifying what many saw as a pointless death. Um, his critics cited many things. They cited his lack of preparation and his cockiness and, you know, they also cited, it's amazing how many of them cited his photographs. He left behind these five or six rolls of film and a lot of them were self, a lot of the pictures were self-portraits like this where he's striking these exuberant poses. And his, his critics said, you know, what kind of takes all these pictures of himself like this. Um, what kind of jerk takes a picture of himself like this? And I knew exactly what kind of jerk takes a picture of himself like that. Because <laughs> I'd, I'd done the same thing on the, on the devil's thumb. Now, um, McCandless was 24 when he died. I was 23 when I went to the devil's thumb by myself, had my Alaskan adventure. And as far as I could tell, the only difference between me and Chris McCandless was that I'd been very, very lucky, and I'd survived my close scrapes. And McCandless had been very unlucky and had not. So I was pretty convinced that, unlike his critics, I didn't think McCandless was suicidal. I didn't think he was mentally ill. I thought he was just young and suffered the ordinary heedlessness and stupidity of youth, of which I knew a lot about. Um, so I went on to write Into the Wild, and. Um, it almost didn't get published. I was just talking to Jeff before the show. This is this, publishing is a weird business. And this book almost, it got bought and then the editor bought it for, for the publishing house was fired and no one else wanted to publish it. And it was just by luck that it was published at all. And no one thought it would sell very much. Uh, I didn't, I just wrote it because I was fascinated with this guy. And um, then people started reading it and I, they sent me on tour and the tour was extended. And when I went on the book tour, and I'd sign books afterwards, people would come up to me and say, you know, I did something like that when I was a kid, or my brother did something like that, or I always wanted to do something like that. And it turns out there's a lot of people out there who identify with the candles, and I was gratified to hear this. And I, I left this book tour early, um, a year ago, March of 96, to go to Mount Everest. Outside Magazine asked me to, to go there as a journalist. Uh, they were concerned about this recent trend over the last, oh, it's only been the last uh, four or five years, really, since this really started in a big way that Everest has been opened up to ordinary amateur climbers, inexperienced, relatively inexperienced climbers who pay 65,000 bucks to be guided up the mountain. Um, the magazine wasn't sure this was such a good idea, so they sent me along on one of these trips to observe it and, uh, and write about it. So in March 27th of last year, I flew up to Kathmandu, which um, is an amazing place. I, mean, I know many of you have been there, and, and it's like another planet. And uh, you could spend months and months there, but we had a mountain to climb. So after a day and a half, we uh, boarded this weird Russian helicopter and flew off to the Himalaya. Now, this is Rob Hall. He was the leader of my guided expedition. He was the most respected guide in the Everest business. He'd already gotten 
39 people to the summit of the mountain previous to this. He was considered the safest, most conservative, most meticulous guide in the business. And I was really happy that the magazine had sent me on his trip. Um, two hours later, we landed in Lukla, 9,000 feet in the mountains, um, in this village here. And now, I, there was eight clients and three guides on this trip, and I didn't know any of them beforehand. Uh, none of us clients knew each other. This was very troubling to me. I was used to climbing with trusted friends, you know, one or two trusted friends, and here I'm with all these strangers. So we all made a big effort to get to know each other as soon as we met. And this is uh, one of my clients. This is Beck Weathers, a doctor from Dallas, Texas. Base camp at 17,600 feet. Um, half the oxygen there is at sea level. Sherpas regularly cover the distance between this village, local and base camp in two days. But they're acclimatized and they're tough. And if, if you tried to do that, or I tried to do it, coming from sea level where I live, or even Boulder, you'd probably die um, or get really, really sick. A lot of trekkers die at these altitudes because um, they go too high too fast. It's really, altitude is a scary thing. Um, but if you go slow, there's no problem. And Rob Hall knew this. So he allotted 10 days for this trek to base camp, which made it really, really nice. It's just one of the most fun things I've ever done because we never walked more than three hours a day. It was completely leisurely. Second day of the trek, we got our first view of Everest from the ground. This is the highest point on Earth, four vertical miles overhead. Now, we can't hear it because it's too far away, but this is the jet stream. Everest pokes up into the jet stream. You can see what happens. It, these 140-mile-an-hour winds hit the summit, and it leaves this contrail of ice crystals. Those are actually blowing two miles into Tibet. Now, this is what this jet stream, you know, it's, it's unthinkably harsh up there when it's blowing like this. And it blows like this almost all the time. Sometimes it lets off and sometimes it comes back. This is what killed five climbers a few weeks ago on the north side. Uh, they were up there when the jet stream came back and they didn't have a chance. They were strong climbers. Um, it was sobering to look at that. Same day we arrived in Nampche Bazaar, which is the cultural center, sort of the capital of the Kumbu, the Sherpa homeland, the center of their culture. And we spent a day here to acclimatize and the next day, we resumed our trek. Uh, now, this country, the Kumbu, around Mount Everest, these, these valleys and mountains around Everest, is some of the most spectacularly rugged country I've ever seen. But it's not wilderness and hasn't been for hundreds of years. The Sherpa moved south here from Tibet about 400 years ago or something. And, and they're devout Buddhists. And they adorn the landscape with artifacts of the religion. And um, they build these altars, these stone altars called chortons on ridges, crests, and hilltops. They put up prayer flags every flap of the wind sends prayer to God, um, prayer flags and all these boulders. And it's, it makes it, re it, somehow it adds a lot to the trek. These. One of the things that makes the trek so nice is we didn't have to carry anything. This yak here is carrying all our stuff. And so all you have to carry is a day pack with a rain jacket. And it was nice. I liked it. And it got spoiled. Um, we did get to know each other as we hiked in. This is Mike Groom, a plumber from Brisbane, Australia, who is one of Rob Hall's guides. And he's a very, very accomplished high altitude climber. He, had climbed Everest without bottled oxygen in 93. Now, this is something only, only a handful of people have done or are capable of doing. You have to be a very gifted, a certain kind of athlete to do it. I mean, I couldn't begin to, I wouldn't even consider it. I would, I would die right away. Um, Mike had also climbed K2, the second highest mountain in the world, Kanchenjunga, the third highest. And on his descent from Kanchenjunga, he'd been caught out after dark in a storm, no shelter. He'd frozen his feet very, very badly. Uh, he'd actually had to have all his toes amputated and parts of each foot. And uh, most people, this would have crippled, but not Mike. He was a very graceful athlete, and he, couldn't, he didn't even walk with a limp. This is Doug Hansen. Now, a lot of the media after the, after the tragedy you know, has reported that all these clients are, are novices. And they, the word that's used a lot is tour groups. It's sort of like we all sort of, it was either, should we take the cruise to Barbados or should we go climb Everest? <laughs> but, you know, a lot of us didn't belong there, but it's more complicated. Like life, this is more complicated than, than the media usually presents it. And Doug Hansen here was a fellow client, being a really close friend of mine. Doug was neither inexperienced nor rich. He was a postal worker from the Seattle area, from Kent, Washington. He had been climbing for 15 years. He paid for his dream of climbing Everest by working nights in the post office and doing construction by day. He'd actually been to Everest once before, the year before, in 1995. Rob Hall, he'd gone with Rob Hall, and he'd gotten all the way to the South Summit. Just 300 feet below the top. But it was 1.30 in the afternoon then when they got there. And Rob Hall has a strict rule. If you're not on top by 2 o'clock, you have to turn around for safety's sake. And he turned Doug around at 1.30 because he wasn't going to make the top by 2. And he felt bad about this. So he invited Doug back in 96. Actually, he talked Doug into coming back. He gave him a really steep discount. Rob was actually losing money by having Doug come back. But Rob was a 
big-hearted guy, and he wanted Doug to realize his dream, so Doug was back for a second try. Every few miles, there's one of these tea houses. You pull in for some chong, the local brew, or some tea. This is Beck Weathers, Helen Wilton from Christchurch, New Zealand, our base camp manager, Andy Harris, who became my closest friend on the trip, um, 31 years old, a very strong guide from Queenstown, New Zealand. Let's see, April 8th of last year, we arrived at the Kumbu Glacier, 12-mile tongue of ice that flows down from the foot of Everest. The day after that, we got to base camp itself. These tents here are pitched on rubble, but the rubble is on the glacier, and the, you know, it's right under your tent. At night, you hear the glacier moving beneath you. It cracks and creaks and groans. It's very eerie. It's, it's actually kind of mesmerizing and nice. Um, it's, it's not a good picture, but there's, there's about 60 tents in this photo. Now, this is only a small fraction of the tents at base camp. They continue down glacier for a half a mile. There's more than 300 tents on the glacier, actually. It was a full-blown city, um, and the mayor of that city was Rob Hall, our leader. Um, he was the most respected guy in the mountain, and any time there was a dispute, people would come to him to solve it, even his rivals, and there were plenty of rivals. There were other guided groups competing with him directly for clients. But Rob was so respected that they came to him, and even for advice, his rivals would come to him for advice, and no one came to him more often than this guy, Scott Fisher, a guide. Scott was from Seattle. I knew Scott before the trip. Scott is a, is a legend in Seattle. He's an amazingly strong climber. He's an aerobic animal. He'd climbed Everest without gas in 94 to become one of the elite to do that. He'd also climbed K2 and many other things. Um, highly respected climber, but he'd never guided Everest before. So he came to Rob Hall a lot for advice, and Rob gave it freely, because even though they were competitors, they were also friends, and Rob, you know, that's just what they did. And Scott hung out a lot with us, and he was camped only a few miles, a few minutes away. So we socialized a lot with his group, and we got to know his team, we got to know his guides. This is Anatoly Bukharev, who many of you know, he, he spends a lot of time in Boulder. He's a legendary Kazakh, Russian-speaking guide, um, one of the greatest Himalayan climbers of the era. He's, he's climbed more than 20 years at high altitude. He'd climbed Everest three times before last year without bottled oxygen. Um, you know, he's, he's amazing. He's in a, he's in a league of his own. Um, this is Lapsang Jongbu Sherpa. Uh, Lapsang was 23 years old, very young. Uh, Scott Fisher had hired him as his Sirdar, his head climbing Sherpa. And he deserved that responsibility because he, he was an amazing climber. He'd only been climbing three years, but he'd already made three oxygenless ascents of Everest. Scott told me that he thought Lapsang was the second coming of Reinhold Messner, the greatest climber of all time. Um, Lapsang was a remarkable guy, and he was very, very popular. Now, most Sherpas around Westerners tend to be shy, reserved, uh, not among themselves, but they, they can keep to themselves, but not Lobsang. He was really flashy and outgoing, gregarious. He reminded me of Deion Sanders. He was <laughs> cocky, and uh, he, he thought he was the equal of any Western climber, and he was, but he didn't mind telling you that. And he was really popular. I mean, everyone liked Lobsang. This is Neil Beidelman, who used to live here in town. He organized, was one of the organizers of the infamous Boulder, Boulder Marathon. He now lives back in Aspen, where he's from originally. He's an aerospace engineer, a rocket scientist, great athlete, great long-distance runner, um, enters all these marathon races and does well at them. And he'd, he'd climb Maklu. Uh, very, very responsible guide and became, has become a good friend. We also got to know some of Scott's clients. On the bottom there is Charlotte Fox, ski patroller from Aspen. Um, Charlotte, Charlotte's a very strong athlete. Uh, hasn't been climbing that long, but had already done a lot. Now, there's 14, the 14 highest mountains in the world are known as the 8,000 meter peaks because they're each above 8,000 meters, 26,200 feet about. And Charlotte had already climbed two of these 14 peaks before Everest. Um, she's getting a back rub here by Sandy Hill Pittman from New York. Sandy had climbed six of the so-called seven summits, the highest points in each of the seven continents. All she had left was Everest. She already tried to climb Everest twice unsuccessfully, and she was taking it very seriously this time. She, she was very determined to climb it. Everest, the Tibetans call Everest Jomo Lungma, um, which roughly translates as goddess mother of the earth. And to the, to the Buddhists, to the Sherpas, uh, this, in the pantheon of deities, their pantheon of deities, perhaps no, none, no god is more important than, than Sagarmatha or Jomo Lungma, as it's called. And before you can walk on her sacred flanks, you have to be purified with a religious ceremony known as a puja. Um, so the Sherpas, for each expedition at base camp, I don't know, there's a dozen of us, a dozen of these expeditions, they built one of these beautiful chortons, these stone altars, and then they erect this pine pole and string prayer flags from it. 
and then you have this puja. You wait for an auspicious day what, when the stars are right, and then you hang your ice axes and carabiners to be blessed from the Chorten, and this priest comes up from the valley, and the, the Sherpas bring out their pictures of the Dalai Lama, who's in town today, I understand, and you make offerings of, uh, of rum and um, Sampa and Snickers bars and other food. <laughs> and uh, and then, then, the, then the priest chants scripture for two hours while everyone else gets shit drunk. And it's not an option. You have, to, you have to drink. I mean, this is nothing, nothing is more serious. No, no, I mean, this is a very serious ceremony. Um, you have to do this. It's very important. So when, when no one can stand anymore, you take fistfuls of, of barley flour and you hurl it all over each other. And then you're ready to climb. Now this, this whole ceremony says a lot to me about the Sherpas because it's a very important ceremony. You wouldn't think of not doing this, but they have fun at it and they take it, you know, it's a celebration and everyone laughs and giggles even while the priest is chanting. And that somehow this is sort of says a lot to me about the Sherpa. So at the end of the puja, you string these prayer flags over the whole camp, sort of like a, a force field to protect the tents from harm. And then hung over the next day, you, you tackle the first obstacle. The, which is the Kumbu Ice Fall, which rises directly above camp. Now, the ice fall is really scary. This is base camp down here. This is camp one, 2,000 feet higher. And in between, the, the glacier spills over this 2,000 foot drop. It's really steep. So when it spills over, it shatters into these huge ice blocks. Many of them are much bigger than this library, size of eight and 10 story buildings. And the glacier in here moves between three and four feet a day. So as it moves, these huge blocks are always shifting and tumbling. And you've got to weave your way up around them, you know. And not just once, you've got to do this. We did this eight times, because the summit of Everest has only a third as much oxygen as sea level. And if you went from boulder to the summit, somehow, you know, in a, in a magic carpet or something, um, and we're dropping the summit, you'd pass out in a couple minutes and you'd be dead probably inside of 15 or 20. But if you go up and down, up and down, slowly, a little higher each time over the course of a month, your body adapts in what are really miraculous ways, and you can sort of function up there after a month. Uh, not well, but you can survive uh, for a little while. So you have to do, go through the ice fall. Every time you go up to do an acclimatization trip, you have to go through the ice fall. We did it eight times. Um, and it's scary. I was gripped every time. Um, there's all these crevasse crossings. They're all rigged with ropes and ladders. It doesn't take any technical skill, but it, I, I was, a lot of times I crawled across these ladders on my hands and knees. I had no pride. I mean, it's scary. And sometimes the next, time, next day you might come up and the glacier would have shifted and this ladder would be bent like a pretzel or it'd be dropped into the crevasse. Um, these huge ice blocks are always shifting. You hear them collapsing around you. Um, every trip, trip up, the glacier looks different. You just hope you're not under one or on top of one when it goes. 19 people have died in this ice fall. You start climbing at four in the morning before dawn because um, it's five or 10 degrees there and you want to do it when it's cold because Everest is just north of the tropical latitudes and it's intense ultraviolet <laughs> radiation. And when the sun hits about eight or 8.30, it gets hot and the glacier then gets even more active. These guys are, aren't out of the woods and you know, they're wishing they were up there, the sun's hit. Camp one is 19,500 feet. First trip up, we just got to the tents, turned right back around, went down the same day, um, feeling pretty sick rested a few days, came up again and felt better this time and spent a night here and then went on from here, Camp 1, up to Camp 2. And you can see the route up to Camp 2 from here. From here, the route gets sort of flat, relatively flat, and it goes up the floor of this deep canyon called the Western Coombe, C-W-M, a Welsh word, sort of like being in the Grand Canyon at 20,000 feet. Um, and you start climbing again up this canyon floor before dawn because as soon as the sun hits the, these icy walls of the canyon, they reflect the radiation back at you and it turns the whole thing into this huge solar oven. And you go from wearing your down jacket and being fr and freezing cold, shivering. 20 minutes later, you strip down your long underwear, put these sun hats on and you're sweltering. I had heat stroke. I mean, I, you know, I was, it was grim. The heat was as bad as the cold. Base camp, you can't see the upper mountain at all. It's kind of weird. You just can't even see that whole upper half of the mountain is hidden behind the western shoulder. So here, you round a bend in the western coombe and all of a sudden you see the summit for the first time and it's pretty sobering. Um, this is the top, two vertical miles overhead. And uh, this just looks like a little cloud because it's hidden behind the intervening ridge, but that's the jet stream, this huge contrail. And now we're close enough so you can hear it. And it sounds like a flock of 747s taking off and you can hear it all the time because it's blowing all the time. And it's very sobering. This is camp two, 21,500 feet. Another view of two. 
it lies near the head of this valley, this canyon, the western Kuma. From here, the route suddenly gets a lot steeper. Um, this is Lhotse, the fourth highest mountain in the world, 27,900 feet. The route ascends what's called the Lhotse face, the steep ice face, crosses this limestone cliff called the Yellow Band, then it ascends this ridge, the Geneva Spur, right here. That's 26,000 feet. That's the South Col, C-O-L, a word meaning pass. It's a pass between Lhotse and Everest. Everest is right up here. This is where our high camp would be, Camp 4, um, from where we'd launch our summit push. This is another view of the Lhotse face. Um, this is the face, the ice face here is more than 4,000 feet, which is too high for most climbers to do in a day without exhausting themselves right before the summit. You don't want to do that. So the standard thing to do is put a camp up in the middle right here, Camp 3, 24,000 feet. And it's not a good place to camp. You've got to hack ledges out of the ice to put tents up. But it's really the most practical way to do it. Um, and then from there, it climbs this cliff, the yellow band, and up to Geneva Spur to the South Col. This is the base of the Lhotse face. Climbers up to fix ropes. Starts out pretty steep up this Bergschrund, but from a technical climber's point of view, it's really not very steep. It's deceptively not steep. I mean, it, it deceives you. It's only about 45 degrees or something. Um, you're tempted not even to clip into this rope, which is a big mistake, because if you stumble or a rock comes down, a lot of, rock comes, a lot of rocks come down here, you're going to fall to your death. Just two weeks ago, a Sherpa was killed because he wasn't clipped into the rope when he fell somehow. A Sherpa on a Malaysian expedition. A number of people have died here. Um, this is Yasko Namba, this woman in the foreground. She was one of my teammates, a client on Rob Hall's team. She was a Federal Express personnel director from Tokyo, Japan, 47 years old, hoping to become the oldest woman to climb Everest. Yasko is tiny. She weighed 91 pounds, she claimed. I doubt she even weighed that much. Her, her wrists were like sparrow's bones. And this tiny woman, I was in awe of her. She was the most determined, focused individual I've ever met. She was inspiring. This is Andy Harris pulling into Camp 3. You can see they're just tents are just lined up here on this ledge that the Sherpas have hacked out of the face. Um, this is the view from Camp 3 looking down. Um, this is Camp 1. This is Camp 2. And now we're at 3, and it's exciting because before, we've been laboring up the floor of this canyon, and it's claustrophobic, and you can't see much, and it's hot. And suddenly, the view opens up, and you feel like you're really getting up on the roof of the world. Now, the summit is still a vertical mile overhead. Um, but you feel like you're getting up there. You also feel really shitty because you're at 24,000 feet for the first time. And I mean, it's like you have a bad hangover all the time. And you try to eat a candy bar and you, I, you, know, you throw it up. I couldn't hold any food down. Um, I'd take a step and I'd be, you know, I was exhausted. Uh, so we spent a night here. I didn't sleep. I don't think anyone slept. And then our climatization was over. And we went down to base camp to rest for four, five, six days. And then we're going to do our summit push. Base camp doesn't look like much, but it's really quite comfortable. There's showers here built out of stone. Um, the food is good. And we're acclimatized now, so the air actually starts to feel sort of thick here. And the most amazing thing about base camp is these satellite phones. Uh, there were four or five of them. Our expedition had one. Scott Fisher's expedition, Sandy Pittman here brought one. Sandy's calling from her communication stand at base camp. And it was very surreal. I mean, I'd done a lot of expeditions, and I never even had a radio before. You know, you go in, and you're, you're out of touch for a month or six weeks or whatever. And now, you know, I'd be lying in my tent at base camp, and I'd hear a phone ring in the next tent over. <laughs> and, so, and someone would yell, John, it's your wife. <laughs> and I'd go running over, and I'd talk to Linda. And it was, I liked that, but it was very discombobulating. <laughs> and uh, one, of the, one of the strange things that I, I, I never got used to, too, because there's phones, People were filing internet dispatches every day, daily internet dispatches. Four or five expeditions had websites. So people back home would often know more about what was going on in the mountain than we did on the mountain. You'd call someone in the States, and they'd tell you, yeah, I hear the Yugoslavs are going to Camp 4. And you wouldn't even know that, you know? It was like, wow, really? And it was very, it was this weird information warp. Now, the first really disturbing event happened right about this time before the summit push. This guy in the basket is Nawang Topche, Sherpa. He's the uncle of Lobsang, that flashy head climbing Sherpa on Scott's team. Uh, Lobsang and Nawang were very close. And Nawang, um, well, people think Sherpas are invincible, that they're supermen and women. And they're really strong, but they're not invincible. Um, these, the diseases of high altitude, cerebral edema, pulmonary edema, strike everyone, regardless of your fitness or your experience. They strike randomly. And Nawang was at Camp 2, 21,500 feet, and he came down with high altitude pulmonary edema. 
this disease, it comes on and, you know, suddenly, without warning, your lungs fill with fluid. If you don't descend very, very quickly, you die. It's that simple. Um, problem was, Nuang got this, and he wouldn't admit he was sick. He didn't tell anybody. Because if you're a Sherpa, these jobs on expeditions are very competitive. It's competitive to get these jobs. This is a country where the annual per capita income is $160 per year. And you get a job like this as a climbing Sherpa, you're going to make 1500 bucks, maybe 2000 bucks for an expedition. So people want these jobs. Nuang's got kids and schools in Kathmandu, and he wants to keep sending them there. And if he gets sick, he's not going to get hired again. There's other guys who don't get sick. So he didn't tell anyone he was sick. Finally, he collapsed and had to be dragged and hauled down through the ice fall. Very dangerous rescue performed by Lobsong and Neil Beidelman. Very bold thing they did. He should have gotten better at base camp, but he didn't. So he was loaded into this basket. You can see he's wearing oxygen. And he was carried down valley to the hospital at 14,000 feet. Uh, we saw him go, didn't think anything of it. What we didn't know was that several hours after this picture was taken, he stopped breathing for five minutes, suffered permanent brain damage. He was put into a Kathmandu hospital, a vegetable. A month later, after we'd all gone back to the States, he died. No one knows this. Nawang's death wasn't reported. All these other deaths were reported, but Nawang was just a Sherpa, and his death went unremarked. We didn't even know about his death at base camp. Um, it hadn't happened yet, but we didn't know he was gravely ill. Um, even if we had, it probably wouldn't have made a difference. We were all so focused on the top. We've got summit fever now. We're going for it in a couple days. So right before summit push, we posed for this photo. You can see how confident and cheerful everyone was then. Um, this is at the base camp Chorton. This is Rob Hall's team. This is Caroline McKenzie, the base camp doctor. She's from New Zealand. Doug Hansen, the postal worker from the Seattle area. John Tasky, uh, anesthesiologist from Brisbane, Australia. Suze Allen, an Australian trekker who didn't go above base camp. That's me. That's Stuart Hutchinson, a brilliant medical researcher from Montreal. Uh, Carol, or Helen Wilton, base camp manager from New Zealand. Andy Harris, my good buddy, um, guide from New Zealand. Beck Weathers from Dallas. Rob Hall, leader. Lou Kosiski, a 53-year-old attorney from Bloomfield Hills, Michigan. Frank Fishbeck, a publisher from Hong Kong. Mike Groom, guide from Brisbane, Australia. And Yasuko Namba, client from Japan. We've been at base camp for about a month now, almost exactly a month. The whole time we've been here, jet stream's been ripping the summit like this, this horizontal. I mean, that's, that clouds form because the summit's poking up into this 140 mile an hour wind, and that's the contrail that form. And, uh, you know, you can't climb when it's like that. But every May, if you're lucky, in early May, the monsoon starts pushing north out of the Bay of Bengal. And when it pushes north, it moves the jet stream north too. So you have this window before the monsoon arrives but after the jet stream leaves, we have calm weather.